Okay, we're live. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Dive Into World Building. <laughs> As usual, we have uh, we tend to spend about the first 10 minutes of the hour working out technical things and trying to get as many guests as possible into the Hangout. So thank you for your patience. And today we have a fabulous guest who is joining us from Brazil, Fabio Fernandes. Welcome, Fabio. <laughs> Hi, Juliet. Hi, everybody. Thank Hi. you so much for having me. Sure. What city are you in? I'm in Sao Paulo. Okay. Ooh. And I have never actually heard that said, so thank you so much for that. <laughs> no I see it written all the time, and I go, how do you say that anyway? <laughs> so that's awesome. Okay, so... Um, Anyway, awesome. So let's see. We're going to have slight delays on the audio sometimes, but we're just going to power through and see how we go. Um, Fabio is an awesome author, and he's also um, he's written science fiction for Perihelion Science Fiction, and he went to Clarion West, and he was also involved with this really cool project called We See a Different Frontier, um, which you guys should all go and check out. Um, and you also write nonfiction, am I right, Fabio? Yes, yes. Uh, we've been, uh, me and uh, Jibril Alayad, the editor of the Future Fire magazine, uh, mm -hmm. we had this project for this, it is uh, from 2013, so it has uh, three years now. And I think I'm safe to say, uh, I can announce it, uh, I had already done it in Twitter a couple of weeks weeks ago, uh, there will be uh, another post-colonialist anthology until next year. Oh, very nice. That's great news. Um, well, so there are lots of things that I could talk about but um, with you, <laughs> ask you about, but let's actually start with the... Uh, let's start with this post-colonialist anthology. Are you, are you editing it? Yes, yes. Um, we did the project uh, um, started in 2012 um, mm -hmm. when uh, Jibril uh, issued a call for editors for uh, the Future Fire magazine. Uh, in, in the beginning, he wanted just to uh, create two special editions of the magazine. Mm -hmm. and and he asked editors to send him a project with suggestions. And uh, in the beginning, we had uh, two editors uh, got, uh, got on it. Uh, uh, Lottie Selke with an uh, anthology called Outlaw Bodies, and it was a, a, an awesome anthology about mm -hmm. genre. Gender, right, sorry. And, uh, and it was uh, in right... Right after that, I sent to him my proposition about above um, of post-colonialist issues. Huh? I was talking to him because, sorry. I'm just saying yes. <laughs> Please keep going. Okay, <laughs> the delay. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, the thing is. Uh, I told him in the proposal that uh, we have been experiencing uh, many interesting things uh, for the past uh, decade, that should say, the past 10 years, uh, regarding new authors from other countries, not necessarily uh, Anglo-American uh, colonies, former colonies. Mm -hmm. And we have, today, we have some uh, very well-established authors like La Vie Tidar, he, he lives in London, but he's from Israel. And Aliette de Baudard, she writes from Paris, France. Yeah. And they all write in, are writing in English, talking about their, their, their specific, uh, specific cultures and point of yeah. views. Uh, there is a, this awesome novel by La Vie called A Man Lies Dreaming. Yeah. Uh, and it's about the whole thing of Nazi uh, and concentration camps, but he can do another a marvelous twist on it, uh, mixing with it with pop fiction and hard-boiled detectives. And um, Aliette has been doing a, a superb job with uh, mixing her uh, Vietnamese ancestry into the into a uh, lots of works 
of different works and even a kind of new space opera scenario. That's mm -hmm. it's been great. And uh, and I I I try I talked to Jibril about this and he was very excited about this uh, this this anthology. And so we spent uh, almost six or eight months uh, collecting stories. Mm -hmm. uh, we had stories from maybe half the world world. Uh, and we got uh, almost 16 or 18 stories in the end, mm -hmm. uh, half of them at, from, from Southern Asia, uh, quite a few from, from Europe and from the United States as well. Mm -hmm. And we got to see a very uh, diverse uh, universe. Yeah. And I believe we, we, I, believe we, we uh, I got what I was looking for, that is to show um, the English audiences, the Anglo-American audiences, there is there is much more to it than um, golden age or space opera, traditional yeah. space opera scenarios. It, you can you can write even using the same tropes as yes, uh, uh, yeah. cybernetics, uh, <coughs> time travel, space exploration, and using uh, uh, other players in the scenario, so to speak. Yeah. So uh, we it was it was very uh, uh, the anthology was successful in my opinion. Uh, we have some stories in scattered about uh, in several years past anthologies, and uh, we are, I I I've, I was very very happy. And since since uh, the, the the 2014, I was I already wanted to do another um, another anthology, but uh, in 14, uh, Jibril Walayad had. Uh, Personal issues, and uh, last year I had some uh, personal and health issues, so we couldn't we couldn't talk about it. But, but you're uh, back on the we talked now. about it uh, three weeks ago, and uh, we will we'll start the a new the new anthology uh, in the next couple of months. I believe. That's good news. So so you know one of the things I I was glad that you mentioned Aliette de Baudard because. She has written very compellingly, uh, not only in her fiction, but she's also written uh, personally about her experience of writing science fiction in English uh, because, you know, she doesn't write science fiction in French. She writes all her science fiction in English. And it's, a, it, you know, I'm not going to try to tell audiences of this video what she said about it they should go and look it up <laughs> because it's really worth reading and kind of complex but part of that is that she's done all of her reading of science fiction in English so she finds that the language of science fiction in her mind is is English for the most part now you're also an author who writes science fiction in English do you also write it in Portuguese yes yes Mm -hmm. I started to write uh, in English uh, less than ten years ago, but okay. I started uh, I started to, to write in, to write and publish in Portuguese at uh, almost uh, thirty years. Wow! Uh, that's okay, cool. Three decades. Uh, I started uh, publishing in fanzines. Uh, I think this happens all over the world, and uh, <laughs> in uh, since nineteen ninety six, I've been publishing in anthologies. And in 2000, I published my first uh, my first uh, short story collection in oh, Portuguese. Cool. In 2009, I published my first novel. I I was just talking about this in, on Facebook yesterday because uh, I pretty much stopped writing in Portuguese um, f four years ago, right before <laughs> going to to Clarion West. But uh, every now and then, I'm still uh, invited to anthologies, and I'm finding myself having to translate my own stories from English to Portuguese. Oh, interesting! Wow, it's it's so very hard I, to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are all uh, terribly. This, uh, uh, <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's an interesting thing because uh, a few years ago, uh, Jeff Van der Meer. Uh, Asked me to do uh, to write a guest post for him, and I wrote uh, exactly about this about this particular feeling, uh, because writing in two or more languages 
it calls you to do uh, a quite a, a, a rewiring in your mind. Yeah. Uh, when I write in English, I have really have to think in English. I have to think uh, uh, in a totally different track. And and, and even the tropes get uh, get very different uh, uh, because apparently uh, it's like uh, we maybe it's a cultural thing. I cannot really tell this for for sure, but we have um, in Portuguese. We treat certain subjects um, in a way, and in English another. Let, let me try to be more clear. Uh, sometimes uh, you have uh, to write about uh, space exploration, for mm -hmm. instance, and we that we we don't have many uh, hard SF writers in Brazil. Okay. Uh, so uh, when I try when I'm trying to write a, a hard science fiction story set in space, for instance. I really have to 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 consult every uh, other other short or other other American or English writers like Alastair Reynolds, uh, King Stanley Robinson, and we had a, a very good writer in Portuguese called uh, Jorge Califi. Uh, Califi was a close friend of Arthur C. Clarke, and he uh, in in the, in the acknowledgments of 2010, I would say two, uh, Clark. Uh, Acknowledges uh, Califi's work in in science fiction in Brazilian science fiction, and also because Califi helped uh, Clark with the outline for 2010. And uh, he's but but he's a really he's a is a, a, a kind of a, he's a classic writer today in Brazil, uh -huh. but he's not writing anymore, and. Uh, he, he followed, he's always followed a very Clarkian uh, <clears throat> mindset. And uh, we, uh, when we, when I write in English, and I have a, uh, a few other friends who write, Jacques, like, uh, like Jacques uh, Barcia, uh, who are also starting to write in English as well, and they told me the same thing. We check what's being written right now in the uh, in, in the English language so you can do better you can strive to do better mm. and in Portuguese sometimes uh, uh, we are I think we are very strong here on uh, fantasy and not magical realism mind you uh, the new generation they don't write magical realism at all they write urban fantasy mm, interesting strong in it but not quite strong in science fiction okay I um, just so you know, I'm over here writing notes. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm trying to, talk, to I'm make the, the delay. write it all down so that people who don't have time to watch an entire hour of us chit chatting will be able to scan over my notes about what we talked about, and so they'll be able to take advantage without actually having to spend the entire time watching the video. Um, okay, awesome. Yeah. So if I look like I'm being quiet over here and not looking at you, that's what's going on. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> well, I've got some questions now. I mean, um, is the Brazilian urban fantasy written in English? Um, and if not, have you considered translating it? I'm like, I want to read this now. <laughs> I, I didn't pick the, the, the first half of the, of the, um, of the no, question. The Brazilian urban fantasy, I must, we are assuming, is written oh, oh, in Portuguese. Okay, okay. Yeah, is he it wants to English? read it. I got it. No, uh, as far as I know, the, uh, at least more than 90, 95% is written just in Portuguese. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think there's uh, some uh, web platforms where a few of the this new writers, they are using it uh, to publish uh, one piece or not, uh, other in English. I okay. can't remember who. Uh, I don't remember where they are doing it. I, I'll try to. I'll try to check it and then send it to Juliet. Maybe so. Sure. She can you know, one notes. thing that you can do is but, if you have particular links or references that you want to okay. send. Since we don't have an active chat bar. Um, here, <laughs> what you can do is All send right. them afterwards, and I'll incorporate them into the report. Mm -hmm. So that people can see them, even if they are not, you know. Okay. 
I'll do that. That 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 will work out. Um, yeah. Okay, so this is very very cool. <laughs> um, very, I you know I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of thinking, you know, one of the reasons why I like to do this show is I like to discover authors who have done things that I haven't known about, right? <laughs> so it seems like, in a way, the the work that we've seen from you in English is sort of just like a tiny little a tiny little tip of the iceberg here and that maybe we'll be able to see more uh, of your work get translated or um, get read by English language audiences in the future which is really exciting. Um, <clears throat> so let's see, let's talk a little bit about what you write in terms of the world building. So it sounds like from what you were saying that you do quite a bit of hard science fiction in English and you like to work with space, am I right? Yes, yes. That's what I'm, do I'm, I'm doing mostly uh, with my time writing in English right now. Do you have a, a particular, um, do you work in a unified universe or is it story by story? Yes. No, uh, I'm. I began writing a, a particular story set in this uh, far future universe called the Obliterati uh, mm -hmm. four or five years ago. But this particular story, which is becoming a novel right now, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I I didn't uh, I hadn't the opportunity to finish it. I'm writing very slowly uh, because of world building. We'll get that to that in a minute. Mm -hmm. But uh, while I was writing this first story, uh, I started to write uh, several parallel stories in the same universe. Okay. Just because uh, every time I got into a, a hurdle, I had several questions which I wanted to ask myself. How do I solve this particular problem? It's uh, usually, I don't know, maybe uh, I think that hard science fiction I don't know if only hard science fiction uh, asks for this, but uh, it's like a, a problem-solving thing. Yeah. You're writing, then some, somehow you get yourself in a, you have an, an obstacle, and then you have to ask the, your uh, yourself the right questions. So sometimes you don't even know what the questions are. <laughs> and I was, I was. That's that's the the thing, right? Uh, uh, to uh, I'm mean, let's start to um, make a long story short. This story, this obliterati story, was originally set in a future, uh, at least uh, two thousand years in the future, where uh, humankind had already colonized uh, several stars, um, star systems in the galaxy, mm -hmm. and. Uh, Suddenly, there uh, an invisible enemy appears and destroys uh, most of the of the planets, uh, and unprovoked, and nobody knows why this enemy is doing it. Mm -hmm. And the story is already set uh, uh, twenty or twenty odd years after this destruction, this obliteration happened, mm -hmm. and most of the few humans uh, surviving. They are living, they are dwelling inside asteroids. Oh, wow. And so my whole question in the beginning was, okay, how they, how are they going to survive there? Uh, were these asteroids already inhabited? And I had to answer, to ask myself these questions. And I, I had to, to, to create uh, miners' communities in these asteroids, mm -hmm. uh, some, some uh, outposts, I, I tried to steer clear of a few tropes, for instance, I don't have any military forces, organized military forces in this universe. I'm, I, I tried to create a, a universe, not a peaceful universe, mind you, but a universe where you don't have these things, you don't take these things for granted. Yeah. So this is, uh, is mostly... A, uh, there are mostly communities of researchers, of scientists, of people trying to make a living, and they are they are not expecting uh, aliens, uh, hostile aliens. Mm -hmm. uh, they already had read too much science fiction 
to believe this could be true. And okay. they are just uh, trying to explore, really explore new, 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 new worlds. Okay. And but I had to at some point in the narrative, I had to create at least a kind of uh, uh, surveillance mechanism. Mechanism. Mm -hmm. And uh, I tried to to do it in the most seamless way I could, and that uh, I ended up creating uh, a, a whole clade of individuals called the Kinocchios. I tried to 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 create this word, uh, which uh, comes from the, the 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 word Kino, that's a Russian or German for cinema, and okay. Occhio, which is in Italian for eye. So this 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 people are most of them are cyborgs. They uh, they are capable of filming everything with her with their eyes, mm -hmm. and they 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 were created as a kind of um, watch people. So you are you are you have to to uh, let's say set up some dis dispute some some quarrel. And so you have these people crawling over the asteroids, just mm -hmm. watching people, filming them. It's like the, the continuous life of Catherine Morton Hall, like uh, the book five by D.G. Compton. Uh, so it's not, it's not a new, new idea, but uh, I tried to, to come up with this concept to help people living in, in the asteroids without resorting to force, to extreme force. I see. But mm -hmm. these people, in one of these stories, uh, these people are also uh, problem solvers by themselves. They don't mm -hmm. want uh, to be passive observers. Right. So they, they, they school themselves so they can be kind of arbiters. Uh, they can arbitrate disputes, they can talk to people, uh, and they can sometimes act, act as detectives. Cool. And the uh, story I created, I, I wrote in, and published in um, Perry Hellion uh, last December called Mycelium. Yeah. And uh, this was uh, regarding another aspect of the of the of the universe. Uh, uh, this universe uh, there, there's a there's a, a very interesting principle I, I try to 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 build around the story uh, which is okay uh, so we have a high tech very high tech uh, community uh, in this universe, but when this secret uh, enemy, this hidden enemy starts to destroy everything, somehow they are going to find that uh, they, they can't have too much electronics because that's mm -hmm. one of the ways that uh, the enemy traces them. So they have to resort to biotech. And they are trying to uh, build another communication systems. And uh, mycelium is the story of how they started to develop using the fungal myceliums uh, to build a network of communication between human beings. Mm -hmm. So they will be able to have a, uh, have a kind of, as I, as I wrote in the story, a chemotelepathy. They will be able to communicate uh, with each other, not on a constant basis, only when they ingest certain kinds of fungus, and they are able to communicate with each other. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> so the, 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 the story, the origin of this technology is portrayed in Mycelium. And uh, no, I just... Uh, the, um, I'm assuming then that, the, that you have other stories in which this technology is more... Uh, highly developed, I guess you'd say, more mature as a technology. Yes. Yes. Is that is that? Uh, the, uh, is that I started to I started to change the time, the original timeline. Right now, uh, I I try to be more um, realistic, so to speak, and yeah. consider that two thousand years is a very long time. I I I I thought that uh, five hundred years would be enough. To develop okay. this, this kind of, of technologies, and so yeah. I I started to write uh, uh, another uh, timeline in which uh, they would have this uh, they would find this all these technologies, and uh, they would approaching uh, a, a very a very uh, um, 
how can I say, um, there will be an end point uh, in this story. I don't want to give spoilers, I, I, but I, I just wrote a story which can be the final story of this universe. Oh, that's interesting. And okay. it's, it's called, and it is called uh, Nine, Paths to, Nine Paths to Destruction. Mm. Uh, this story is currently with a magazine. Uh, I, I already talked with one of the editors. There's a, a good chance the story will be accepted, but I didn't have the green light to talk about it yet. We will let you uh, keep your so, <laughs> Okay. <laughs> but this story, uh, it's, it's, uh, from the, it's a first-person story, uh, and first uh, told from the POV as at, uh, of the, the protagonist of the first story. Story, the original story, Obliterati. Okay. Uh, he was a, he was a pilot of the first story, and this in his future, this in this in Nine Paths, he's a Buddhist monk. Uh, he was already a Buddhist. A, 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 a few of the so uh, most of the population of the asteroids is from uh, southern Asia. Mm -hmm. India, Brazil, and a few countries of Africa. So okay. you don't have many uh, uh, Anglo-American characters in this story, at least in the beginning. Yeah. I, I'm, 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 I'm coming up with an explanation for this. I'm writing uh, another story where they will figure more. There will be more America, uh, uh, people of American and European extraction in the, right. the next stories. But uh, I wanted, I also wanted to show this. How how can uh, people from the third from third world or for former third world, how can they thrive in space? Because mm -hmm. usually people uh, uh, people see 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 Indians or uh, Kenyans uh, or Brazilians as people with no particular uh, particularly good scientific skills. Yeah, well, that's and, not true. And uh, yes. that's simply not true. <laughs> But uh, I, I'm trying to, to to show people that we can also be there. We can also be in space. Uh, and so uh, I'm trying to to put up uh, several things in this in this world building uh, without trying to be um, without to try to be much uh, of a fanatic about them. Mm -hmm. Because I, I, I think about the I think about Buddhism. I'm I'm. I'm trying to to put religion in this universe without sounding uh, um, without doing proselytism. I I'm, I don't want to do this. Right. But I, I have in the story. I have already in the story. Uh, uh, not only this uh, small uh, Buddhist refugees, but I also have uh, one uh, one of the characters of the original story is uh, Jorgensen the first. She's the first trans woman uh, to be pope. To what? And they, to be the pope. Oh, to be the pope. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm writing this story uh, as if uh, the Catholic Church had uh, pretty much uh, gone the way of the, of the dodo. And uh, the in in uh, among the this chaos uh, chaos in the asteroids, uh, this this woman uh, tries to to rekindle the flame of the of ah. this of this particular church. But uh, with a, with a, with a, another as a, 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 a very different set of 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 instructions of commandments, and trying to discuss this without being uh, without doing proselytism. Of being a sort of zealot. Uh huh. Okay. Wow. So, so yeah, because I mean, you've already got this scenario where <clears throat> most of the humanity has been wiped out and the planets have been destroyed, right? So that people are living in these little pockets in these asteroids all over the place. And so, what I'm understanding is that you have a person who, you know, is intrigued by Catholicism and the idea of the whole thing and is trying to kind of revive it, but the terms of that revival are very different. Am I understanding mm -hmm. correctly? Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. And this person will be instrumental uh, in uh, helping helping people in the asteroids, not only to survive uh, spiritually or, or, of, or of mentally, but also physically. Uh, she is going to be uh, a person who will try to come up with a way out of this of this chaos. 
I and uh, I, I don't want to create, uh, I, yes, I'm, I'm not creating, trying to create any uh, religious f figure, uh, <laughs> so to speak, but uh, uh, I'm trying to, to, to I'm trying to create a universe where people can be the most human they can be, without resorting to myth. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Uh, sometimes you read stories about this. Uh, you still uh, these days you still read stories about that uh, awesome uh, space captain, which is also a uh, Kirk, a Star Trek Kirk-like figure, who. Uh, and, and he's is always a white male of Anglo-American extraction. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> and you, always knows exactly. You don't see you don't see many many new things. Yes. Uh, one of the one uh, to be honest, one of the very few good things I have read lately is uh, the Expanse, it's both both the book oh. series by James Corey uh, and and the the sci-fi series which I really like. It's, and uh, I had to say that I, I, I can't I, I can't thank them enough because I had to change several things because one or two things that they are doing in the expense I was doing it as well in my story so I had to change them. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's the way it is. I, it, it was it was it was uh, in the end it was very good because I have I had to think outside the box. Again, I had to think outside my box and the box of, as I was uh, telling you before, uh, the state of the art. Let's put it this way. Yeah, How is yeah. the state of the art of science fiction right now? And the experts just set a, a, a higher bar right now because yeah. we really have people from several world countries and the, the language of people in the in there in the asteroid belt in the expense it's awesome with each a, a mixture of, of several words uh, and they they all these gestures they do because in the beginning they were all uh, wearing spacesuits and they couldn't uh, they had to to be readable at a distance to yeah. their fellows and yeah. this this is a this is a, a marvelous thing I hadn't come up with the solution but I I'm trying to to do a, a Bit of a different thing regarding the language they use in the yeah. asteroids. So, so I'm gonna I'm gonna make you keep going <laughs> because because okay. you know I'm a language geek, right? So I want to hear what I want to hear what you have to say about language in this universe because it seems like the kind of environment where language would um, split and diversify very quickly because of the isolation of these various populations. Is, is that something that you're exploring and, and can you tell me a little bit about what you're imagining in that environment? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, I knew you were going to, to make me talk about this because we had talked about this um, a, a couple of months before, if, if you remember. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, all, I'm also a, 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 a a language geek. I, I, I love to study languages. I unfortunately, due to work, I couldn't uh, study uh, the way I, I wanted to. But I, uh, when I was young, uh, uh, I studied uh, a bit of Latin, a bit of Greek, a bit of Japanese, and I. But I, I sadly, I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't go further with these studies. But every now and then, I like to. I like to try to read books in other languages. I, uh, for instance, like right now, I'm reading. Uh, I reading thing. I reading the stories in Italian, uh, which is a, a language I, I, I don't I don't speak, but I I, I can read uh, a bit in French and German as well. But uh, for for the benefit of this story, I pretty much uh, put most of these languages aside, and mm -hmm. I I'm trying to come up with. Uh, uh, not a conlang, not a constructed language, but a, a, a organic uh, evolution from what we have now. I, I, I was thinking particularly in two examples, uh, the Catalan language and the Papiamento, which, are, which is a language talk in, in the Caribbean. Mm. Both, both languages have uh, strong Latin roots mm -hmm. and uh, Catalan uh, 
the Catalans don't like to, for us to say that, but, but uh, they, uh, but Catalan seems to me like a, a really, really strong and very good mix of uh, new Roman languages like uh, Spanish, Portuguese, French, a sprinkle of Italian, mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, and in 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 the in the more than a, than a, than a spade of lat of old Latin, and yeah. they are, it's a, it's, a, it's a marvelous language. I, I love. I, I also I can't I, I can't read most uh, texts in Catalan, but I can't I can't speak the language for my life. I, I I'm very sorry about that. Uh, I'm trying <laughs> I to go. Uh, I really will try to go to Barcelona uh, next November because of the uh, Eurocon. But I, I'm not sure if I'm if I'll be able to go. I can only hope I can go and try to learn a bit more until the end. Uh -huh. But uh, Catalan is a, it's a, I, I'm fascinated by Catalan since my teens, mm -hmm. and uh, approximately 10 or 15 years ago, I also heard of papiamento. Papiamento is a, is a, is a, it's more interesting and more easy for us, uh, for Portuguese and Spanish speakers. To understand, okay. because it's a it's a it's a language that grew mostly on um, Curaçao and Suriname, uh, I think, uh, that uh, former Dutch colonies in in, yeah. uh, in, uh, in the Caribbean. I don't, I really can't tell you right now uh, the or about the origin of this of this language. But uh, what I can say is that uh, people in these countries. Use it uh, a, uh, this mix of Portuguese and Spanish to talk uh, uh, among themselves as a uh, a way of uh, getting themselves closer to Spanish uh, speaking um, uh, Latin America. Yeah. And so right. they started to 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 create this, this this language, which is very interesting because when we say this word, the very word of the language in Portuguese, papiamento, it doesn't have any particular meaning in Portuguese. But mm -hmm. it seems very close to papu. Papu is just chat, just talk. And uh, the, the suffix mento it also uh, usually is just a, f a formal way to use something. And so uh, it's a kind of a, a formal talk, a formal yeah. chat. It's, it's translated literally. Uh, yeah. uh, and it's very, it's a very, very easy. Uh, again, it's the kind of thing that's so close to to my language, uh, to my native language that I can't speak it, because I will certainly make several mistakes. Sometimes <laughs> it's, it's easier to speak in a very different language. It's, yes. Uh, even if all my mistakes, it's it's easier to talk in English than to talk in uh, Catalan or Papiamento. Yeah, I hear you. But it's it's very it's very interesting to so to to study because I'm trying to understand a bit of this of the the mechanism of the grammar because uh, I what I'm trying to do in my stories is to create exactly this okay so you don't have uh, you have Brazilians you have uh, several people from across Latin America and mm -hmm. but you have all, you also have uh, people from from Kenya for instance from Ghana. Mm -hmm. And uh, a, a few uh, uh, in several of these places, in these African countries, for instance, you have uh, former English countries, former French, uh, former mm -hmm. Dutch or, or, or German, and uh, and you also have some some uh, tribal languages. So, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry if I'm uh, using the term; it's not always correct. But uh, Swahili, for for instance, and uh, um, I'm trying. I'm forgetting right now. You have several very interesting from the uh, from the, the the center to south uh, of Africa, of the African mm -hmm. continent, and uh, Yoruba, for instance. Mm -hmm. And Yoruba is a language that most of the, the African slaves which came to Brazil they they spoke Yoruba. Okay. So uh, in our tradition, our culture in Brazil, we really use lots of words in Yoruba. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's it's, mm -hmm. it's uh, I think it would be rather easy to, to for us to speak a few words in Yoruba, for instance, mm -hmm. and uh, mixing it with Spanish mm -hmm. and Portuguese. And so I I gave this 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 language the tentative name of 
mistureba. Mistureba has an African, has an Yoruba sound to it, but mm -hmm. it's a, uh, as far as I could as I could uh, research, I did not create this, this 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 word. This word exists in Brazil, and it's a very informal word to uh, mix a mix up of things. When you say, "Oh, this is all too mixed up," you say, mm -hmm. "Ah, isso é uma mistureba." This is a mistureba. This is a, a very mixed up thing. And yeah. usually, usually we 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 uh, not talking about people, but about, about things, about a, a whole setup of things. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this very this is very this will be very funny for any Brazilian who is reading one of my stories because that will be the will, that yeah. will be the uh, the Portuguese this is, speaker. It's not a serious story, egg, right? <laughs> Yes. Oh, it, it, but it's very interesting thing because you 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 said just uh, uh, just the thing. A Portuguese speaker, uh, 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 a person from Portugal, will, yeah, will right. not understand this word. Okay, this great. Word so is it's usually, a million uh, from, uh, in Brazil, but it's, it's very interesting because uh, uh, yes, Brazilian Portuguese. That's another thing. Uh, since the 1980s. Several linguists have been stating that uh, our language is now fundamentally different from the, the continental Portuguese. Is that how well, that's we, we use we speak the, the, the Portuguese in Portugal? But I, I, I was there. I was in Lisbon last year to uh, uh, to a panel on science fiction with Lauren Bukes representing uh, representing South South Africa and uh, yeah. João Barreiros, which is um, one of the most famous Portuguese writers. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I had a I had a great time there, and I could understand everyone. And everyone could understand me. Uh, <laughs> so uh, sometimes we have this 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 kind of anecdote in Brazil. Whereas, oh, if you want if you go to Portugal, you don't you won't understand anything they say, and vice versa. It's not true. But it's not true. <laughs> do a, a very interesting cultural cultural thing. Uh, our soap operas, our telenovelas here. Are uh, very very popular in Portugal, so uh, <laughs> many, many Portuguese friends have told me that they are speaking. Uh, 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 we are they, we are they are starting to to understand everything we say in Brazilian Portuguese because of these novelas. <laughs> uh, and so, no, so we we have we we hear can hear their accent, which is very different from ours. Yes. Um, but uh, most of the expressions they use in their in in, in daily basis, uh, it's they, they they are becoming uh, contaminated, so to speak, by Brazilian Portuguese. So uh, it's 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 good for us to understand each other, but it's not very good for culture. You know, I really don't. I think... you know I I'm a descriptive linguist, and this is the kind of thing that happens. You know, languages meet and they trade things without really meaning to and it's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. I've, exactly, I've exactly. to come down on the side of actual usage rather than on the side of we need a special academy to make sure that our language stays pure, <laughs> you know, because um, that, you know, you can only hold those things back for so long, <laughs> right? Yes. Um, what you were just but, but what you're describing with your um, with your language that you're working with and the, and the languages that have inspired you are are languages that occur in places where populations are overlapping and speaking different languages. So I wonder if you would characterize the language that you're working with as like a Creole language. Yes, yes, I would. Def okay. Definitely, it's not a constructed language. That's it's more it's more organic. Than that, so, right. so so really, really, it's a, it's a Creole language. Okay, now you, uh, Che, you know what a what a Creole languages are? Um, mm -hmm. not specifically. Oh. Okay, so so uh, this is worth mentioning briefly for people who aren't as familiar with what a Creole language is. Um, so you've probably heard of pidgin languages. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you have a place where multiple populations are coming together and they don't speak mutually intelligible languages. Mm -hmm. What will happen is that people will start to kind of create their own language and they're not inventing it. They're just using a few words 
from each of the several languages that people generally tend to understand. So like the most obvious word for for something that everybody can kind of, oh yeah, I've heard that one before. So they'll start to use a collection of the most useful words from all the different languages that are being used in the area so that they can communicate across these language barriers okay and so over time what will happen is the people who are living in this area tend to have a vocabulary that is multilingual but that everybody is agreed upon so it becomes a a language that everybody agrees on but it's not it is not any of the source languages does that make sense yeah okay so you've got these people who have this language that they've sort of cobbled together in this area that's perfectly functional but they kind of invented it out of all of the different mismatches of things right mm -hmm. then they have children and the children learn the language as though it is a native language and as they do that they add things to it so they add grammatical structures to it and they add um, all kinds of different stuff to it okay at that point it becomes a Creole language okay so a Creole language is a full-fledged language with grammatical structure, with its own life and and linguistic being, right? Mm -hmm. That has grown out of a pidgin language, which was the language that didn't have the full structure, didn't have all these elaborate linguistic constructs that it gained when it was learned by the second generation. Okay. Okay? So... Creole languages are very cool, <laughs> um, but but they have this, and this is what this is. I think what Fabio was talking about is that they have this background in places where people are coming together, speaking languages that they can't understand each other with, and it's happened. I mean, it happens all over the world, mm -hmm. right? And there are people who specialize in studying Creole languages. Anyway, yeah, that, was, yeah. that was a linguistic digression. <laughs> yes. And they're all some digression. <laughs> um, but I think it's really, it's not something that I see a lot in, in uh, well, you know, like it gets gestured at. In science fiction and and also in fantasy, you you know you'll you'll hear um, you'll hear certain kinds of you know they'll say well this is the this is the common tongue, right? Or or it's the local patois. Yeah. You know that you'll hear these these languages uh -huh. sort of referred to, right? Yeah. You know, well, you know around here we just kind of all speak the same language even though we have separate languages that we like to prefer to speak but you know we all kind of come together on this one thing and I'm not sure people are really consciously aware that they're referring to Creole languages in that kind of context or to pidgin languages but but this stuff actually does happen you know, you do get a convergence of multiple populations, and then they come up with a language that they kind of all can agree on. Um, but it's, you know, but but generally speaking, it's like, well, you know, the common tongue happens to be English. Well, in a in a more realistic kind of scenario, what you would actually end up with is is some kind of a Creole language. Um, so I think it's really fun that you're going that direction, <laughs> Fabio. I think that's wonderful. I'm 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 really trying to do a, a thing a, a thing a bit different. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, honestly, well, because, uh, we're we're towards the end of our time. So let's let's see if we have some some final thoughts. I want to hear what you were just saying, though. Okay. So what were so, you just saying, Fabio? 
Well, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the, the the last thing you say. No, no, you you cut yourself. I cut you off by accident, but you were in the middle of you were about to say something, and I wanted to hear what you had to say. Oh no! Okay, okay. No, it's just that uh, that's very it's very interesting uh, to deal with the the, the languages. Uh, following this proposition you just said because uh, every time you see usually in TV shows but also it becomes widespread in literature you go to a, to another play than the planet or you another colony world in a story and everybody speaks the same language mm -hmm. I, I'm I perfectly uh, okay with the conundrum there is uh, to, for you to write a story and even if everybody's speaking a different language we will, you you have to speak to to write all of this down in English yeah. for the benefit benefit of your reader, of course. Yeah. But uh, at the same time, uh, several people have been posing this question the past uh, few years. Every time uh, we speak about uh, representation and diversity in literature, mm -hmm. uh, people are very comfortable to accept orcs and elves and not black people. Yeah. Not women, women protagonists. Yeah, or, yeah. Or uh, lesbian protagonists. The same thing applies to languages. Yeah. Same thing. thing. You think uh, everybody speaks English? No. We can speak Thai. We can speak French. We, speak, we can speak Portuguese. We can speak some of the several languages they speak in India. Because yeah. as, as far as I know, I can be wrong. At least 17 official languages in India only. Yeah. So we, we, we still have hundreds of languages in the world. And you, you want to read something very interesting, you go read Jack Vance uh, in a book called The Languages of Paul, which yeah. talks wonderfully about this subject, but he's not, in, this, in this story he's not straying from, the, from English. But Dune, Frank Herbert did a, 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 a very good job with the, with the tools he had in the, for the scope he had in mind about using uh, words from um, from German from uh, uh, from uh, Russian if I don't uh, if I'm not wrong uh, mostly of Arab uh, Arab extraction and uh, and people can understand yeah and people can understand him mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the, the, he, this, this my challenge in this book is this. I don't intend, at, at least not right now, not far for this this novel. I don't intend to create uh, uh, this 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 whole Creole language. I intend to to, but I intend really intend to furnish the reader with uh, these options, these keys to, to understand it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and I really want to do. Uh, I I'm, I'm experimenting with this. This this two short stories I just wrote and had. I think we published it. People speak only in English. There are hints, though, of uh, Mr. Eba, but they yeah. speak only in English. But the, the other story uh, in Obliterati, I'm making a, a, a few of the speakers speak only in Mr. Eba. Mm -hmm. They will speak most of the time in Mr. Eba. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, the protagonist which speaks, who speaks in English, he will act as a translator to us. And right yeah. now, my challenge is to how to equate these things, how to make these things work, in order so so the reader don't get, uh, oh, this is too dull. I can't understand anything. I, I <laughs> don't want the reader to. Yeah. Well, I hate to cut you off at this point, <laughs> but we are out of time. So. <laughs> Thank you so much for I'm coming fun. to talk to us. Having fun. Thank you for telling us about your projects and about your language that you're working with. And this has been really fascinating. Um, can't wait to see the next thing that that shows us this universe. And I hope everybody else will will feel like going out and looking for your work as well. Um, any last minute questions, Jay? Um, <laughs> aside from all the other questions. <laughs> I know, I know, because um, I, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's a good question, like, how do you get language in, and especially if, like, I am a product of American public school, and pretty much just know English, um, you know, and I'm not a linguist, I 
I don't know how to put anything else in. Um. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's uh, well, I mean, it's it, we're lucky actually. We're lucky to have, you know, I've obviously had a lot of experience with foreign languages, but I think in some ways these works of fiction that grapple with really interesting and complex linguistic situations are a great way for people who have grown up only speaking English to broaden mm -hmm. their minds and actually get an experience that is multilingual in a very different distinct way. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I'm gonna have to stop the broadcast there even though I want to talk to you for another two hours. <laughs> But thank you so much for making this happen and for for connecting with us all the way from Brazil. I, I'm super excited that we had a chance to talk to you. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. Uh, news about uh, the show. Uh, next week we're going to meet uh, at the regular time as far as I know. I have no idea what we're going to talk about, but I will be on Twitter and I will let you know what we're going to talk about. Okay. All right. Thanks so much. Stopping thank the you. Podcast.